Thank you for coming out on this very uh, hot afternoon. Uh, we are delighted to have this distinguished panel with us this evening. Unfortunately, uh, uh, Almay Ouv, the Navajo Development Institute, is not able to join us this evening. Uh, he sends his regrets. Uh, so in his place, Dr. Thamesway has uh, kindly agreed to uh, take his place and to talk about uh, Myanmar, the past. Uh, I would like to um, first ask you to please turn off your mobile phones so as not to disturb. Uh, the format this evening will be each of our uh, panelists will have 30 minutes to discuss the past, the present, and the future. And then we will have an additional 30 minutes or so for Q&A. All right, so um, I will turn the uh, microphone over to Dr. Thamesway who is a professor of economics, finance, and globalization here at Payap University. He's been with us for about nine years. He was formerly with the uh, Asian Development Bank, and before that with the Burmese Ministry of Finance and Planning. And uh, we are very sad that he is going to be retiring next month, so this will probably be your last chance to hear him speak at a Paya Presents. And I would like to publicly thank him for organizing tonight's event, and for his many years of uh, dedication and service to uh, to Piop University and to educating the young people um, here at Piop about issues um, in the region. So I would like to thank him in front of everyone. Thank you very much. And I will turn, yes, thank you. And given the, uh, the, the times in Myanmar, uh, as it were, there's a good possibility he might be uh, doing some more exciting things um, with all of this. So we have great expectation even in his uh, third retirement. Um, so I will turn the microphone over to Dr. Thamesway and he will introduce our two other panelists. Uh, thank you, Adam. Uh, not that I'm trying to be secretive. It is better to be, to be careful than not to overstate where you are, what you're going to do. But this, this will be my second, second retirement. Anyway, I'll, I'm the moderator for this, e this evening. And the, the, the reason I decided to organize this was that before we organized this, it, the Myanmar or Burma was not a big, a hot issue. But as we start organizing, it became very hot. And then that's the reason the weather today is also pretty warm. Uh -huh. And uh, we want to look at today, Burma yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So we have three outstanding speakers. Unfortunately, our uh, colleague, Aung Nai Wu, due to unforeseen circumstances that he is not here today. So in this place, I'll give the presentation of the yesterday. And then we'll be followed by uh, Dog Keoma. He's a well-known activist with the Burma Partnership. And uh, I think he's well-known in the Burmese circle. Thank you very much for coming all the way from the uh, US and then from Mesot. And then the third speaker, Third, but not the least, he is well known among the Burmese community inside and outside the country. He is no other than Aung Zor, the chief editor of the Irrawaddy magazine. And I'm sure that if you want to know anything about Burma, that's the place where you go to look for it. Of course, some of them are a little bit high, no? but anyway, you get a lot of good things out of it. Thank you. So, before going any further, let me start with Burma or Myanmar yesterday. And we'll have 30 minutes each and then followed by Q&A. Well, Myanmar or Burma or Myanmar, uh, Myanmar or Burma or Burma or Myanmar, I'm not very strong on it. So I put on both of them. And let's see what was it yesterday. It is a country uh, located in the very strategic region, the two booming giant of Asia in terms of the economy. In the northeast is China, in the northwest is India, the west is uh, Bay of Bengal and Bangladesh, southern part is the Andaman Island, on the west is Thailand and Laos. It is the second largest country in Southeast Asia, or in ASEAN, only next to, to Indonesia, which is nearly the, the double the size. In terms of population, it's pretty uh, um, 
not too big but not too small. 60 million rich natural resources, arable land, forestry, minerals, and fresh water. But at the same time, very poor. The poverty, poverty incidence, according to government, is around over 67% in the rural areas, is nearly 30%. That's the contrast. And I've been always saying that whether this is a resource curse or the Dutch disease, we call it, the country is rich, but the people are poor. So there must be something wrong with the mismanagement. Yeah. But in terms of religion, Buddhism is the main religion, but there are also a lot of Christians, Muslims, Hindus, and a significant number of animists. The country is divided into seven regions and seven states. And I think most of you know they are who they are. But I just want to go into the ethnic nationalities. They are all together roughly about 135. The major ones are the Chen Kaya, Pien, Chen Mon, Burma, and Rakhain. And the one, the map shows where they are. And you'll be surprised that the yellow or the yellowish color is a Tibet to Burman group, whereas the other colors are a Mongolic or Thai Shan. Now, in, uh, in terms of population gain, you see the darker color. The Burmans consist of nearly 70%, Shan about 10%. Korean about 7%, Rakhine, a significant number of Chinese, Mon, Indian, and others. I just want to show you this map that Burmese are quite aggressive, and we have three uh, empires, and this is the famous one, known as the Tangu Empire, where it stretches all the way right up to the border of Cambodia and all to Man Manipur on the northern part of northeastern part of India. And this was the downfall. The Burmese were very aggressive. They, when the Indians came over to the British India, the Mahabharata went to attack. And that's how the Burmese kingdom lost its identity. And if you go a little bit further, you see that there were three Burmese empires, the Bagan period, the one in Shops, the, the one you saw was the Tangu dynasty and the Kombang dynasty where it ended and the British came in. The British were not able to come in in, a, in, in, in one war. And there were three anglo burmese war. 1824 to 52, followed by 52 to 85, then the third one, 85 to 86. That's where the whole of the country became under the British. It was ruled as a province of India, so it was known as the British India. But during the period up to, uh, from the beginning of the, uh, the British took over the whole country, there were skirmishes or minor rebellion all over the country. The nationalist movement continued. And during the Japanese occupation also, now during World War II, the Burmese uh, Independence Army fought back first against the British, and then with the, uh, with the uh, sorry with the together with the Japanese against the British, and then later on against the Japanese with the British. And when the when the Burma Army, uh, Burma Independ Independ Independence Army decided to join the British. The understanding was that Dewey Mountbatten agreed that after the war, the Burma would get its independence. So with, with those promises, the independence was received on the 4th of January, 1948. But Burma was divided into different parts during the British Burma. The province of Burma was in four divisions. This has a background why we have the present situation. The tennis room and the arcane was taken in 1924, uh, 1824. Later on, the lower Burma, PQ, and the Irrawaddy came after the second anglo burmese war. But Burma proper is not the union of Burma that we see today. There were areas known as the scheduled areas, the Shan State, the Chin Hills, and the Kachin Tracks. 
what you will notice a frontier area or we call it a sometimes like excluded area or scheduled area which became the states in the independent union of Burma before that in 1943 there was some sort of a independent Burma under the Japanese known as the Asia Co Prosperity Sphere but the Burmese found out that it was not a real, a true independent. So in March 27, 1945, the anti-fascist resistance started. And up to today, it is commemorated as the resistance day in Burma. But when the Kuntao, the military government came, came into power, they changed the name from the resistance day to a, what is it? Army day or the military day because they consider this the founding of the Burmese army but uh, most of the people still consider it to be the resistance day but the government didn't like the word resistance because they changed it to army day before independence if you look a little bit back even during the war the Conserv conservative party agreed to give independence in three stages huh? it was self-government, dominion status and independence but the Aung San and his young Turks did not want to wait that long. And with the re-establishment of the British government after the war, the anti fascist People's Freedom League participated in the, the Legislative Assembly and they won the majority of seats. Landslide and the Governor General of the British uh, requested him to form the government. He became the vice chairman of the governor's council. But unfortunately, during a negotiation between Aung San and the Prime Minister of UK, uh, Atlee, while they were negotiating, we find that the, the Karens, you know, who were fighting on the side of the British, felt they were abandoned. And this is something I want to uh, clarify the historical part. The Terrans were the privileged or the, the the loyal group among the Burmese and many of them became Christians. So because of being Christians and Western education, a lot of them got uh, Western education in the uh, UK coming back. But they found that in the civil servant, in the military, in the, in the, the police, a lot of these higher echelons were all Karens. But the British decided to uh, discuss about independence with the majority Burman instead of the Karen. So the Karen felt that they were abandoned, although they had been, been loyal, they were together fighting in the Second World War. But Aung San was very smart. He knew that the Burma proper alone cannot exist. So he organized what is known as the Pan Long Conference on the 12th of February 1947. The hilly regions, the ethnic group joined together and agreed to form a federal union. But let us uh, remember that Karen did not sign that uh, Pan Long Agreement. The, in 1947, the Karen National Union formed their own uh, Karen Central Organization in 1945, which was formed in 1945, and the KNA, the Korean National Association, which was founded in 1981, continues. But I want to emphasize again that Korean being a privileged group in the British Burma, the Korean uh, ethnic group were the only ethnic group with a national holiday on the Korean New Year. And even today, up to the present government, it's a current year, the only ethnic group which is recognized as a national holiday on the new year. But unfortunately, during the struggle for independence in 1947, July 19, General Aung San and his cabinet, many of them were assassinated. So the draft constitution has to be continued. So in September in 1947, it was agreed that under the federal union, Soshui Tai, who 
who's a soul war of the prince of the Shan, the Tai Yai, was uh, elected as the new president, the first president of the Union of Burma, and Ulu was the prime minister. In 48, 4th of January, early in the morning, Burma was declared an independent country. And under that constitution, the, the Kachin, currently, or the, or the Kaya, the Shan, you have these constituent states. These were the three states. And among the three states, I just want to mention that because of the Panmong Agreement, the Kaya and the Shan states were given a choice under the Panmong Agreement that after 10 years, if they are not satisfied, there could be a referendum, and if, there, if they agree to secede the union, the Panmong Agreement allows them. But in the case of the Chin State, they don't have that right. If you look at the, the Kachin State today, the half of the population or half of the area is uh, the, the people there are non Kachin. So when the Kachin State was formed, it was agreed that they will be not they will not be allowed to leave the Union of Burma. Now right throughout the independent Burma, the AFPFL or the anti fascist People's Freedom League dominated the political scene. But from the very beginning, the civil war grew out. As I mentioned, the, the lower currents felt they, had, they were abandoned by the British, although most of the senior military officers, police officers, and the civil servant were all current. But at the same time, with the communist China taking over the whole of China, the remnants, the Kuomintang Party, Kuomintang forces retreated into Burma, inside Burma. And there were a lot of insurgency groups during the period. You find the, even the Communist Party is not one, two. There's a Red Flag Communist Party, the Burma Communist Party, the Moon National Defense Organization, the Pro Western, the KND, the Korean Defense Organization, which is the arm wing of the Korean National Union, which you still find it today. And there were many others. It was a period of independence, but no unity. And we say that 1945 to 47 was a period of unity, but there was no independence. Now, this is the post-independence uh, period. In the earlier part, 48 to 62, we have what is, uh, you, can, you may call it a democratic government led by the AFPFL. But in 1958-59, there was a split. Now the, the, the Prime Minister Uno and U Chonying and the rest of it. Because of that, the government, there was no stability. To, so the Uno government handed over the power to General Ni Win as a caretaker. At that time, the caretaker government was a Technocrat government, it was not a military government. They have all the engineers, doctors, legal experts came in. So from 58 to 60, China, the Burma was booming. And in the, if you read the World Bank reports, the other reports, you find that after Japan, people considered Burma was a country to take off in Asia. But um, unfortunately, with the split in the political party, the, another point was that at that time, we have what the professor, Fanevel, the economic professor in Burma, is a British, uh, what should I say? OB, OB, you know, follow the British Empire and all these titles he's got. But he mentioned that Burma, although it was developing, it was a plural society. The, the Burmese people were poor. But the foreigners that came in after the Suez Canal was opened up. The lower Burma Delta became a uh, rice growing area with the indentured Indian laborers and the Chinese coming in. So the, the foreign expats that came in became richer, whereas the Burmese population was marginalized. So it became a plural society. The Burma was booming, but the Burmese were not uh, moving up the economic ladder. So that was one of the reasons that we find General Ne Wing, no? 
although it was a technical government, he was looking around and see how to continue his power. And with the fighting between the political parties, by March 2nd, 62, this was a real military coup. And the excuse was that Burma should be for the Burmans, not for the foreigners. So at that time, a lot of Indians, Chinese, left the country. And from 62 to 88, Burma has what is known as a Burmese way to socialism. Unfortunately, with the misrule and mismanagement, in 1987, Burma was declared the least developed country, or the poorest country, one of the ten poorest in, 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 in the world. But I want to add here that although uh, people have been accusing that Burma became the poorest country in 1987, it was administered to become a poor country. It is not in the history book, but the inside story is that the German ambassador went to meet with General Lee Wen and saying that all the loans will be waived if you get the status of being the poorest country or the least developed country in the world. So a lot of data were, were played around or administered in order to prove that Burma was poor. And I just want you to know that there were three criteria to be included in the least developed country. One, per capita income should be less than $275, which at that time Burma was. The second was that in terms of industrialization of the manufacturing sector should be less than 10%, which it was not so, it was 11, 12. So it was doctored to make it below 10%. The third one, in the social sector, the education literacy level should be very low, but at, at that time, the Burmese literacy was over 80%. We don't qualify, but the data were played around in, in order to get the status. But unfortunately, although in 87, the status was declared, by 88, they were simmering uh, the discontent. So Burma did not enjoy being an LLDC with the waivers of these loans. Before the loans were waived, there were people's power demonstrations, student demonstration, the well-known 8888 came in. And then because of that, by September 89, this was the second military coup. This is a real military coup. Huh? But the junta, with no uh, apologies, declared that we are a military government for the first time. The previous one was a cover-up as a socialist government, but this time, he says, Hunta. And General So Maung became the senior general, followed later on by Tan Shui. But they found out that because of the international pressure, there should be some sort of an election being done. And there are a lot of uh, questions being asked why they had that election. There was an election in May 1990, where Aung San Suu Kyi and, his and her National League for Democracy won, let us remember, 59% of the vote. But it was a simple majority, so the, the NLD won 81% of the seats. And I just want to let you know that the military government at that time had a survey. They went into different parts of the country and they knew that there was a solid 40% that they could win. And at that time, 1990 election, there were <coughs> over two, three hundred parties competing. So the military thought that if you get 40% and the rest of the 6% is split up, they could still form a government. But the Burmese people were much more mature, no? you may say. The 60% solid went into National League for Democracy. So the balance changed, there was a next line. Uh, election won by the NLD. Just to uh, recall, Aung San Suu Kyi is not the only uh, child, uh, child of the uh, General Aung San. She is the third child, the only daughter. And the junta did not hand over the power. The excuse was that we need to draw a constitution. And the seven steps Roadmap to Democracy was introduced. At 
the last one was the election in uh, 2011, November. But before the election in May 2008, you remember there was a cyclone Nakis, the ARD Delta was completely destroyed with all these uh, grievances or difficulties where tens of thousands died injured or homeless. The government continued to have the referendum on 10th of May on the new constitution, followed by a parliamentary election in 2010, November, and as we all know, the UN, U, USDP, the Union Solidarity Development Party, won over 75%, including 25% reserved for the military uh, member. The parliament was convened on January 2011, appointed President Tay Singh, who was the Prime Minister, as the new president, with two vice presidents, Tiao Miu, who is also ex general, like Tay Singh, but a civilian. A Shan ethnic nationality. He's a physician, became one of the vice president. But let us remember that majority of the national level appointees are former or current military officers. Now these are the three guys we have now. The center one is Tay Se. On the right is Sai, Sai Mok Kham, the doctor. He's a civilian doctor. And on on President Teng Seng right, or the left, is the Tura Teng Amiru, the general also, another general. Now, November 11, after the election, there were a lot of meetings between the uh, Aung San Suu Kyi and some of the cabinet members, now followed by even meeting with President Teng Seng, that led to a number of understanding, and then Obama called up Aung San Suu Kyi, and that's how uh, Secretary Clinton met with Tay Seng and Aung San Suu Kyi. Now, one of the head of the government, Yin Lak, went to Burma. It, she was the first uh, head of government to meet with Aung San Suu Kyi, followed by many dictators, huh? the foreign minister, uh, foreign minister William Hick from UK, EU, Norway, Denmark, a horde of uh, foreign delegations went to Burma. And on January 18, it was agreed that the, 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 the new election law will change and the Aung San Suu Kyi's National League for Democracy could re-register as a political party. And on the 1st of April, as we all know, she was elected as a member of parliament from Komu Township. Now this is just to show where we are in 2011. Huh? Myanmar from one of the richest countries in Asia with abundant natural resources became the poorest country in Myanmar is here. Less than $800 per capita. Whereas Vietnam, after the Vietnamese war in 1975, has been able to go up to over nearly uh, 1,400, 1,500 per capita income. So reform and political changes, I will not continue anymore. I leave it to the second speaker who will be speaking about what is happening in Myanmar today. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, you have to excuse my nasal voice as I, I just came back from U.S. with this um, that's a beautiful weather in Washington DC with all these flowers around which give me all these allergy problems. So I think I'm feeling really sick. But I'm glad I was able to make it here today. Um, thanks to Sia and all of you for um, organizing today and all of you for joining this afternoon. Um, as the other days we already uh, shared with you the past. Um, just jump into today, I guess. Um, well, for the last 18 months kind of time, I'm sure you all have been those particularly for following on the situation will see there's a lot of excitement as you hear from the media or those of you who probably have already flown into Rangoon and meet with the people with a lot of excitement and hope with answers which is big picture all over the country. 
um, yes, for the last 18 months of the time, in spite of the, um, the speculation before the, the election in 2010 that it would still be rather slow, but then it turned out to be rather fast. And some of us even see it as a bit too fast, which worries us a lot of where things are at the moment. Um, some of the development, positive developments, um, apart from Alsa Suchi's picture being able to carry all over the country with no problem. Um, yes, there have been uh, some positive developments, particularly in the area of the media, for example. Um, Organization on the media, and also the some level of tolerance when it comes to the political activities, political activities being organized. And we see Dawn Sensuji is able to travel across the country, even though there were some you know, disturbances here and there a little bit during uh, our campaigning before the by election on April 1st. But what we've also seen is if you actually look at carefully on a day-to-day -day basis, you will see some of the positive, positive developments either be incompleted or, in some cases, total reverse. It's a, it's a complete return in some ways. And I'll just, I'll just give you three examples. One is the release of political prisoners. The release of political prisoners being a call from all over the world, including from the United Nations, if for Burma to move into a genuine national reconsideration or a very democratic reform as a country in transition will carry on, there is no way, no reason for the authorities to keep any of these people behind the bars. But if you look at all the moves the positive developments or the positive actions and moves that have been carried out by the current government has been very well calculated that I would say. It's a, it's a very well calculated effort. And um, one particularly is the political prisoners. Before 2010, 2000, before 2007, uh, the suffering, very well known suffering movement led by the, the Buddhist monks, Burma had about a little over 1,000 political prisoners. But after the 2007, Burma had more than 2,000 political prisoners. Now, Burma has more than 900 political prisoners. That's the number that we know for sure. So, if we are to actually measure of that aspect of the countries moving into the democratic transition, for those who actually risk their personal freedom and, and life, and being tortured and ill-treated in the prison should no longer be kept. Particularly in this time, if we are actually going to work for the democratic transition. But what the regime, the current regime did was, in last January, they released more than 300, added to the previous ones. All the, almost all the well-known activists and political leaders. And ever since that, you don't see them, you don't hear them talking about another release anymore. So what that tells us is, what is going to happen to these more than 900 people behind the bar? Let alone of those who were released, are still released with the condition that they can still be arrested and put back in the prison and serve the remaining terms that they didn't finish while they were released. Many of them, my very close friends, were sentenced to 65 years in prison when they were released in January 2012. They only finished like four years time, which means they still have about 60 years if they are ever found to be guilty. What the talk also tells us is that whole range of oppressive draconian laws in place are still in effect. So when we are to look into current today's Burma reform, you can see that Government is really touching some level to some extent of on the economic reform. But also when it comes to the political reform, particularly the very core fundamental problems to deal with, such as the legal sector, the legal reform, or the justice sector, 
There is no sign that we can read from the Nepal regime that they want to touch on this, these particular areas. So these draconian laws are still in effect. Whereas that you see also some positive side of this in the parliament. The parliament is actually coming up with some good laws, such as like peaceful assembly. Yes, it's good. But then you have the draconian laws in effect that you can still be put in jail for practicing that particular law. So even though the parliament is still quite immature in terms of the capacity and also their understanding on lawmaking, you still see some positive sides being driven, made effort by some individual progressive parliamentarians in the, in the, in the, in the parliament. One thing that we also look at as a, a complete reverse or incomplete um, development is such as this very bold decision of the president that he said last year, if you will go back, you will see probably the office, I don't know, the list of dam suspension. There's this large, there are seven, seven dams being constructed up in the north, in the Kachin state, where the current fighting is taking place in the Kachin state. And then this particular largest dam, where the two rivers join together to become the largest river going, uh, uh, flowing across the country. And that dam was actually suspended by the president. The whole world praised for that very bold decision. Particularly while Burma was seen as baby of China, under the control of the China Chinese government. The whole world think that Burma region will not be able to get out influence from China. But then all of a sudden, this, uh, the president came up with this very bold decision to suspend this piece of death. Those who were campaigning inside the country and outside were all very pleased with the decision, were, were very excited. And he gave the very um, charming, very charming reason because he's the elected government of the country and therefore he listened to the people's will. Of course, then we all question, well, what about the other dams? <laughs> well, what about the other, like, Shui Gas Pipeline Project, which is going to cut across the whole country from the west all the way to Yunnan State in China, where the 75% of the electricity is going to China? Well, I don't know about that. But what we know now is that particular decision, which, which got applaud from US, EU, <clears throat> and ASEAN, that now on the, on the ground, the villagers who were displaced from that particular area were not allowed to go back. Those who returned, I think it was last month or in March or in February, there were hundreds of villagers who returned, were actually threatened at gunpoint by the district authorities. Either they leave or they'll get arrested. So, when we talk about there are some positive, positive developments being aired and being, being um, fit, favored and, and, and you know, reached to the whole international media and to the policy makers around the world, then we have to see whether those positive ones really are trickled down to the people on the ground in case of this particular wisdom down. We don't see that. We don't see that. And in fact, people who campaign for the, stop, the, 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 the stopping of this wisdom down after the president's uh, decision, they're like, great. This is wonderful decision, but then you have another but at the end. What is that but? Is that's a great decision the president made, but he said it's during his term, it's suspension. What does it really mean? During his term as a president, how long is going to be? And suspension, which means that will be reversed. So again, like I said, some of these positive developments, if you really look at carefully. A lot of doubts and a lot of questions and suspicions on it. Um, the other thing is, at the current reform, we don't see there is a clear policy laid out by the government. Nobody knows where this current reform is really going to go and how long, what is the time frame. It's a complete military-led process, top-down. Probably Donald Sensu knows to some extent, or maybe all, but we don't know. And those people in the country also don't know where is this going to lead. And it, it lets the people participation, of course. And that also leaves the people in dark, not feeling sure of 
whether this reform is really going to bring the real positive or the real substantive change in the end. Um, the other thing is that, like I said at the beginning, there are key sectors that need to be addressed for any transitional country, for any transitional country, to get onto the right track that transition was not reversed. That includes this whole law and legal sector. We still have this total absence, lack of rule of law. Dawn Sasuchi continued to address this as a, a very major component that needs to be addressed, but we don't see a sign from the authority side. And also, we don't see this existing laws, and no, we, don't, we don't see that the, the, the authorities are touching on that at all. So, what is telling us is that, yes, you see these positive things coming up, but yes, there are these existing problems or the existing key law sector or the justice sector is a major problem that nobody wants to talk about. But most of all, most of all, the very elephant in the room of Burma situation, the army, nobody talks about the army. If you ask any of these people who are positive about the current reform, if you ask, so where is the army? What are they doing? All these commanders used to be very mafia-like, you know, people. Where are they now? Nobody can talk about it. Well, but that very, very same army continued to be the same one, committing, continue to commit the very human rights violations, particularly the non-Burman ethnic nationalities people are facing in the remote conflict area such as in, in Kachin or the Karen or the Shan or the Mon. So now we have I want to bring you into the next level to look into the Burma today. Like the Seattle's we have already laid out, this is a plural society. It is a multi ethnic nation. Burma, the Union of Burma as a country that you know, is built, is a house built by the equal partners together. There is no one who own the house who ran the other. The Burman is not the owner of the house. I belong to the Burman majority. This is not a house that I belong, that I rent to the other non Burman ethnic nationalities. No. We come together. Even in that coming together, like he said, Sia, some of those ethnic nationalities like Karan didn't come together because they were already skeptical of their self-determination and equality from the beginning. So what that tells us is, in order for Burma to move forward, in order for Burma to really achieve a sustainable peace and development, we need to tackle the very core issue of this inequality of the non burman ethnic nationalities that be 60 decades of the conflict. And this is the time Burma cannot afford to lose allow the ethnic nationalities to lose their hope and their dream for the equality and self-determination. Saying that we're out in, we're now with the, the, the ethnic, uh, with the national reconciliation, the Burman, non burman ethnic nationalities are actually in more than 60% of the land in the country where all these natural resources are abandoned. Whereas the Burman majority are more in the central area which is more dry out. And if you look at all of these Burma becoming the new market in the world, or the, the latest uh, you know, uh, market frontier. Where are those natural resources that everybody has their eyes on? The gold rush. It's all in these non-Burman ethnic nationalities areas. So this is also one of the very core reasons the current government is pushing the non-Burman ethnic nationalities who are taking up armed resistance for decades, rushing them into signing any kind of agreement. So now, if you if you monitor carefully of the current um, peace negotiation, as you will call, but you see it still lacks the very substance of the politics, but it really is driven on the very purpose of the economic purpose. For all these ethnic nationalities are driven into impose on on them to sign. Let's say if you are a Korean. And then if you meet with the government uh, negotiation team, and if you are leading the KNU, then you are asked, what do you want? You said, I have 11 points that I want to propose. 
Then basically you get told 11 flights, check for 12. Silent. Whatever that is. So, you've been pushed into a, a situation where you have no equal footing. Where you are not able to ensure that your political dialogue and aspiration can be really settled at the end. And when you really look at the two sides, they're two very different goals. The government side wants you as the non-government ethnic nationalities who are taking up arms to just sign. And then their promises will come with the foreign investors and set up the special economic zones in your area. So you give up your arm, in return, you'll get the jobs. Well, if you ask the, all these ethnic nationalities by generations struggling for the equality, they're not struggling to get a job in the 21st century. That's not what they're trying for. Sacrificing all their, you know, um, and trying to protect their territory and, and, and their, uh, their uh, inheritance from their ancestors. But they, work, they, work, they, work, they are all trying for this equality. So, then, you do have two different, very different stories on two different goals in that. So, 60 years of the conflict, can we actually rush into the six months' time that the Navy law is given? Absolutely not. So, what, the, what you are seeing now is different ethnic nationalities are trying to, some of them have been rushed into already, so that you see in the media, in the AFP and Wall Street and New York Times that all the uh, Burma uh, ethnic insurgencies are signing the peace agreement. But in the reality, it really is not that substantive. Many of them are in a very sub, very uh, preliminary stage of signing. They're trying to spell out what they want and how they can really achieve their political aspiration. But at the same time, you, are st you will also see when you look at these, even the preliminary ceasefire agreements have already broken up in some areas, like in the Shell. It's already a, a fighting there let alone talking about this very intense fighting in the Kachin state. So you see the, the regime reaching out to some of them with the olive branch, whereas you see, in, such as particularly in the Kachin, they're sending in heavy artilleries and more troops from, November, from April 1 to April 15, in two weeks' time, there were 64 attacks from the Burma army to the Kachin outpost near their headquarters. So then you can really start to see where is this current reform and the national reconsideration. Can we be very, like, can we feel, like, relax, sit back, and, and take a breath, like, great, it's all going so well. For someone like myself, no, I can't be relaxed for seeing what I'm seeing now on the ground. The dilemma that we're having is also in the current structure within the, within the, the, the politics in the, in the, in the country. The regime really wants, what they really want is every kind of this seven part roadmap to democracy. Of course, what they, why, they, why they threw all these seven step roadmap? Why they held this national um, uh, convention? Why they held this election by force, try to secure their mandate? Is of course they want this more legitimacy from the whole world. The legitimacy come along is the economic benefit. The World Bank and the IMF coming in, the sanctions being lifted and etc, etc. So in that particular situation, the regime's ultimate goal is bringing the all oppositions under their legal fold, which is the 2008 constitution, which is designed and crafted very carefully to prolong the military power in the country in the face of the civilian uh, government. So now we have Do Aung San Suu already um, entered the violation, winning 6.6%. And you have more than 60%, I mean 80% who are the military party plus the military uniform together in the parliament. So we still don't know what is going to happen. I guess we'll hear from some of the scenario from Guangzhou as he will talk about what is, the, what is, what is it for tomorrow. But I guess at the moment the dilemma now is because now NLD, I'm sure those of you who follow the news will know the latest is because NLD refused to take the oath to... safeguard and protect the constitution. So they want the, the word change from safeguard and protect to respect. We don't know what is going to come up. I guess we'll hear some of the, the speculation from Kwanza and here. But I think along with all these uh, such uh, quote-unquote positive developments and reform process, 
my personal, very, my very own feeling is that I still don't see the sincere or the genuine political will from the Nidhi Rasad. And we don't know where the army is and why army is quiet watching, while army don't follow the two executive orders of the president to stop fighting in the Virginia state. That is scary to us. Saying that, what are we facing? Today, I think our country is facing no longer as previously as one regime faced in India, but I think we're facing some other different new regimes. Let me just spell out with all due respect to those new regimes, such as the IFIs, World Bank, IMF, ADB, multinational corporations, transnational corporations, and we have all these eight agencies rushing in from all over the world, peace process, peace fund, peace and development fund, national reconciliation fund, state and peace development fund, whatever that you name is, all coming together. That is a bit more complex than ever before, I would say, and which is the, the, the opinion shared by many of my colleagues in the country at the moment. Saying that, I just want to just stop where, where I present you and share with you my findings and my observation on that today's format, and I just want to hand to my colleagues. Uh, I think uh, Mahuma made a very, very articulate uh, remarks, and I'll say I also very good presentation, so I don't need to talk about it anymore. Like but uh, I'm now, uh, I have to talk about tomorrow. I'm not an astrologer, and uh, I cannot predict uh, what will happen then, uh, tomorrow. Uh, I think uh, I think I will present two scenarios. Um, what could happen in Burma? I, th I think uh, the first scenario is tomorrow. Uh, future will be very bright and very interesting uh, because we are going through the transition, and we are going through after the transition period, we're going through the uh, uh, liberalization period, and then there will be time to. Decentralization period. So there were three periods in Burma we go through. If we go through all these periods peacefully, I think we would see a very different a new Burma in, in, in the next uh, five to ten years. Uh, even though there are some hiccup in the parliament, uh, as the uh, NLD now is uh, dragging the feet. Uh, disputing over the oath. Uh, I believe that uh, in three to six months, uh, NLD will be in the parliament anyway. Uh, because there will be a decision, will be very permanent decision will be made by the House and City and uh, leadership, and they will be in the parliament, and uh, the dispute will be over. Second, uh, because of uh, NLD in the parliament, and, uh, the one of the main respected, uh, inspiring position being in the parliament, even though uh, they are minority, uh, I think they will make a very visible and very strong position uh, in terms of uh, changing and amending constitutions. Uh, there are a lot of issues to be uh, to be debated, uh, to talk and to discuss at the parliament. Uh, there are a lot of issues of waiting, and a lot of champions are waiting uh, uh, for the position and means to, to work very hard, to do a lot of work uh, at the parliament. Then uh, we will see in 2014, Burma uh, is having an ASEAN summit and uh, Burma is ready. Uh, even today, if you look at the, uh, our website and uh, other uh, mainstream uh, news, uh, we'll see the... Uh, yeah, which one? Uh, the SEA Games, yeah, 2000. Uh, I'm just sorry. Uh, yeah, 2013 there's a uh, Sea Games, and uh, 2014 there will be an ASEAN Championship. Uh, I is ready to take over. And I uh, think even today, the uh, EU is uh, uh, saying that uh, they're very glad that uh, Burma is no longer a pariah. And so that thanks between the, uh, it's no longer thrown in the side of the uh, EU or ASEAN, and because Burma is always trying to hijack or not hijack being, being a troublesome 
we want to, to, to improve the relationship between the EU and uh, ASEAN. So I think that thing is already sorted out, and uh, I think uh, it takes for the final out. Then now, uh, in 2015, we will see the development fully integrated into the ASEAN FTA, and so on. Burma has been preparing for that. And, and also, meanwhile, we will see refugees, uh, repatriation of refugees, the IDP, and the mining, and rehabilitation, and all kinds of humanitarian missions going into Burma, and uh, peace uh, making process, and ceasefire being achieved in some areas, and finally, these refugees are being sent back home, and, uh, and, and probably there's a lot of good stories coming out of Burma in the next couple of years. And, and the U.S. and Burma relationship will greatly improve, and because of the factor, it's because of China, and a lot of things could happen. And uh, we were probably back to Burma in this 2000, in three to four years only ourselves. Uh, I myself went back to Burma uh, two times already. I was given a journalist visa. First time I went back to my country uh, as a journalist for five days, and the second time they gave me another six days visa, and they gave me a stash another four days. And uh, so I spent all those 15 days in Burma uh, trying to meet uh, opposition members and uh, activists, and government leaders, and ministers, and MPs. Very, very interesting trip I made. So I, I expect that even my uh, probably back to Burma, you know, in at least two or three years, I won't be surprised. <laughs> so I think it is it was a very interesting time, I think. Uh, and so this is my tomorrow in Burma, the first scenario. So things look good. Second scenario, yes. That uh, it, when I was in Burma, I, I, I heard a joke, uh, people kept talking about when the uh, pacemaker stopped, what would happen in Burma? Because of the president, uh, they say, Allegedly, I believe that he's wearing a pacemaker made from a singer. Uh, so people, people, <laughs> people in Burma joke and ask a question. Even some minister asking me that what could happen, which is I think I'm going to write this uh, next week about. It's very interesting. If, what if pacemaker stop? I don't think we have a time to repair it in the Singapore. So <laughs> that will happen. Because, because, I mean, to give him a credit, he is the least corrupt. He has a little connection with the uh, cronies and the tycoons, and, uh, and he's very strict and uh, he's very much uh, straightforward. He looks very soft. And he looks very, he's, he's very bookish. He's a bureaucrat and uh, he, he reads a lot of books and he's, he's, he's a good guy, it seems to me. But, but he, he's very weak and he's, he is surrounded by a lot of junior and senior officers whom I met in individual that are very keen to improve the image and uh, you know quite sincere. But but the problem is that um, they depend very much on one individual, which is the president, who is honest. At least I believe he's honest, uh, sincere. But I think if we don't have a, a very good institution building process in this transition period, if we depend too much on one person, and a position side they also very much depend on consensus, what if there is no consensus tomorrow? I think a position will have a big, big dilemma, a big, a big, a big challenge. So also in the government side, I think there are a lot of dark elements, there are a lot of conservative figures, there are a lot of uh, corrupt uh, butcher, those who are involved in a massacre and uh, who are not trying to pretend to be a uh, reformist or pretend to be, you know, you know, liberal. These people are uh, are locking behind, uh, waiting for, you know, they are they are, they are waiting to pounce. They are waiting for a senior opportunity because they are sitting on the fence. Uh, they don't believe in this reform process, and president seems to be pushing hard and with an inconsistency. I don't see any inconsistent consistency in this reform. It's a hit and miss. Some people said that it's very fast. Some people said that uh, it's, it's too slow. To me, I think I think I feel like I feel like 
one day I sit on a, a, a in a bullet, bullet, uh, 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 high speed uh, bulletproof train, you know, and next day I, I feel like I sit on a uh, bullet bullet cart uh, for, for 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 three months or six months or one year, you know, but but you feel like only one day you sit on a high speed train. And this is a reform process in Bombay. So you hit and miss. It's probably, uh, I think a lot of things need to be done, uh, haven't done yet. You know? So I think there, there's a big danger of that. Uh, give a bit of hype, uh, give a bit of uh, a lot of credit to the, this this current uh, process. So that's a my scenario. My second scenario is what if this space is going to stop? What will happen? Because the odds people will come back and dark elements will come back to power because of the committed crimes. It's so so rich, and I I I was invited to some of the houses, uh, the very rich people, military leaders, and uh, having a drink with these people, and then you know, blue label, gold label, and then I was I had a chance to as a journalist, as a chance to observe. Uh, I saw a Ferrari, I saw a Lamborghini, I saw the uh, low rides, I saw the. Uh, you know, wine cellar, which is about this room. Uh, about I thought one they were taking me to wine cellar. I thought I thought that okay, this is this wine cellar in my imagination. I, I, he was giving me wine, not about to treat me. But actually, <laughs> wine cellar is this one, about this size. And inside the inside the inside the inside it, it was it's a, it's a, it's a, he collected uh, wine from. 18th and 19th century, I think it's, I don't ask, but I think it's maybe about 20 million dollars worth of wine being saved. And 20 minutes away from, away from, drive away from the house, you see but people have nothing to eat. Right? I mean, it is a Rangoon. I mean, it's, it's let alone mention the, uh, the ethnic areas, in the current areas, in the modern areas. I went to Mandalay and I, I felt so sad to see that uh, how you know Chinese take over and how the people, the local people, very resentful towards uh, Chinese, the way that they look at me as a, as a, I'm an I'm invader and I am intruder, and the other ones who own the country, and then even my driver, as soon as uh, we enter the Mandalay, he started talking to me in Chinese. He was joking. He was talking to me in Chinese. But we were joking, and he started talking to me, speaking to me in Chinese, because uh, we are entering the Chinese sea. You know, it's, 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 it was so sad to see everything is falling apart. But when I raised this issue back to the uh, ministers and the MPs and uh, the, the speaker for the upper house, very powerful guy came on me, I met him for two hours. And these people seem to be out of touch with uh, the August issue. I mean, talking about preservation restoration, conservation work, and a lot of temples, a lot of things that are about Chinese, and, and, and I think they were so happy to, to tell me about how big is the, the parliament building is. I was taking a, a tour that uh, is, they, they demolished the two mountains, 850 acres building. Because of to build the parliament building, which is, which is about 850 acres, they have to demolish two biggest, two big mountains in that area. Demolish, make it flat, so that they can build the, they can build the, this, uh, you know, ugly, very ugly uh, Chinese style. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, again, China, I, I thought it was a very, it was kind of resonate uh, Chinese. So, uh, I look at it, I asked uh, who, who built it, and I realized soon that because we had one road, all this stuff. And I, it was given a, given a contract to uh, Tommy Nine, who is Stephen Law, he's a, a son of the uh, former drug lord, uh, Steve uh, uh, So he, 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 was, he was given a concession trade, concession to trade, uh, sorry, uh, build this, this uh, parliament building. It, it, was, it was totally a uh, Chinese style build, parliament building. So was, I mean, we are already. In, in the hands of uh, China. So all these are, I think, uh, dark elements. I think in one will happen in the tomorrow is Chinese will not give up Burma very easily. Whatever happened with the West and China is watching, watching very, very closely. There's a, there's a, even there's a, even possibility of a, a proxy coup 
I don't mean that the real crew, but it's a proxy crew at that the China will invest in it, in the politicians and the military, and that they will give them money, because they already brought a lot of people in, 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 in our system, that they can clearly tell that these typhoons and that these military leaders, <laughs> can we have a coup? You don't, you don't need it. You don't need to shoot the guns. And you, you can just buy and then stage a coup. So these things are, I think, I think, uh, I reserve, I think these things could really happen in this two to three years, five years of work, if things are really lose out of control, if things say lost and if his base maker uh, stop working. And so I think, uh, and also at the same time, we see that a lot of gold rush, like the uh, Omar reason, just, just, just said that uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of a, how do you call it, a clonic, uh, you know, it's uh, people without thinking and going to burn. I always tell, and I, I, I'm sure I'm, I'm disgusted by a lot of people that, uh, that don't wear, uh, don't wear any rose colored glasses. Don't put that ear plug. Don't put the plaster. Just, you have to go with the silver, not with the reality. With the, with the, that is happening on the ground. But even in UN and ASEANs, everybody is going back to Israel. Like, as if they have no, no other alternative. Uh, you know, even in Nandia yesterday, the uh, UN uh, chief uh, advisor to uh, Ban Ki Moon. He was writing something in an opinion piece in the New York Times. Uh, he, 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 it was good, okay, if I told the uh, you know rhetoric, um, but he was also saying that uh, Burma could become an Asian tiger. So I'm not sure whether he's a UN guy, or he's a trade minister, or you know, you know, yeah. <laughs> you, 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 you see that all these people are so excited about this this uh, half baked uh, reform process. So, I think there's a real danger for, for us to, to see that people being conduct gold rush without thinking any, any, any without having any institutional memory on what is happening in Burma. And because when you when you really go to Burma, uh, when you talk to activists and uh, dissidents or you know nine or team I met uh, we suffer hugely suffer from trust deficit. Trust the visible in the whole country, but, and then they very, very, very distrust the current regime and even in this reform process. The regime has, has at, the same, on the, at the same time, they are very sophisticated and then they become very, they know how to manage a public relation. Even in this MISO things, I totally agree with Maoma because of, you know, Burma has about 91 to 94, if I'm, if I'm correct, if I'm, if I'm wrong, if I'm correct. The 94, I think, hydropower pro projects, and then currently, I think, over 60, and then 45 uh, Chinese companies are involved. And if all the projects are completed, uh, we're going to produce 43,000 megawatts. Burma currently needs only 6,000 6, megawatts. And then, but, but, but the, the, the story is only we have only 25% only, uh, of the population has access to electricity. All the electricity, if we have them, uh, will be sold to China and Thailand. And uh, I, I, don't, I don't think we, we really own our country. Who owns our country? It's obviously, I don't have to answer that question. You know, you know. So, so this is, this is uh, I think, a big problem. That I don't think President Tsai say, you know, anyone who are leading the country has any idea at all that how to fix these things. When I raise this issue, I can now email them, I can talk to them now, I have access to these people. When I raise this issue, they're really very shy to listen to. Or oh, they won't talk about it, this issue, because of this is too big to handle for them. Because, okay, they stopped the missile of $3.9 billion project. What about 29, 29, mil, 29 or $30 billion project, gas, which China is going to build, or started building a gas pipeline, as well as a railway project. Cut through the uh, Shan State and uh, Arakan State in the middle of Burma, etc. But I saw our pipelines and it was so. I, I think uh, I think our dignity being raped. So I think this is this is these are the I think challenges we're going to face. Uh, I think Burma tomorrow, if you have if I have to describe it, it, it doesn't look it doesn't look very very rosy. It looks stay very bleak. We need a visionary leadership from both I think government and organization and all.
as, as well as from, you know, uh, from civil society groups and the media to really challenge. But if you look at the newspaper, and even if you could maybe look at the AR or whatever, you know, things look great because of media keep pumping up all these great stories about them, which is not really a true distortion. And I, may I beg to differ? I think Goma is a very good Jew teacher. The only thing is we need to build the capacity. And there is a lot of xenophobic feelings, the mistrust. The reason I'm saying is not only foreigners. I met some of our activists or some uh, pro-government people in Singapore. They are, they are Singapore citizens or Singapore PR. We went back to Burma and they said, you know, the Burmese counterpart, I mean the, the civil societies, they said, we don't need you. They are Burmese, but they said, we don't need you. Don't come and be our sayah. Don't come and teach us. Don't come and be professor. We know. We struggled through this 60 years. We know the grassroots situation. Don't come and be, be a sayah, a professor. But that is the situation back home. So we need to look at it, but I for one think that capacity building is the most important thing. With that, let's get some questions from the floor, from if you like to. Uh, can I take three now? Jens, Pepsi, we have three. So please, and then we have another three. Yes. I have a question for Hong Song. When you're talking about your days in education, yeah, uh, you're talking about basic space maker. But is it really that frail to break down the system? Is it only basic, but it's not supported by some junior ministers? Is it all uh, depend on, on him? Okay, let's say the second one. Does it prove that the army regime, uh, they need more money and they need more corruption? That's why they need uh, reform and they use Aung San Suu Kyi to open the reform stage and get more money? Okay, now whether Aung San Suu Kyi is being used, it's that one. <coughs> well, uh, I think Burma was always treated a little bit like an exception, and comparatism has been rarely, very rarely done. Uh, with Burma and you don't see any country where you could see in its development as a model or in its inspiration uh, for what could be done. And I don't think I'm thinking about Indonesia and comparison has been made so would you see that Indonesia has to kind of go for development? So would you see this? Okay. What's the first question? Uh, uh, it's uh, pacemaker. Yeah. Well, I think it's fragile. It's, it's not only pacemaker. I think that there are a lot of a lot of people. For instance, there's one minister. I don't want to mention the name of the minister. Actually, he was involved in massacre. I just found out. He was involved in a. He was junior officer, he was ordering troops, he was commanding his troops during the uh, September uh, military takeover in 1988. He was a junior officer and uh, he's now a minister of one of the department, one of the ministries. And uh, I'm just recently found out that because I bring a lot of people, a lot of ministers, a lot of ministers. <laughs> I'm a journalist, so I, I, it's alright, I'm not compromised. But, uh, because I need to get gears of you know what what they think. So I just found out that he 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 you know these people caught he 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 was now he received about three hundred thousand dollars for one of the you know, things that you know, give a commission to his relatives. So they make so much money so much money. They make so much money from from the, in their powerful position, so they don't believe in this reform process. That's why I think I think they say I still think our sense of is right to say that uh, it's, it's because they say it's the the the, 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 uh, the best alternative at the moment that she can work with, uh, and there's nobody else, which is also very dangerous for us because of this transition is so fragile. So many people are waiting that uh, they, they pretend to go along with him, actually not. That's my that's my idea. Um, Jack, 
just to add a little more on the, the, the question uh, um, that you said. What some people, you know, some people even say that he, yeah, he, you know, many people say that he's reform, reform minded, reformist. But also, some people say that he's decisive. I think for me, is the question is, not a question, the, 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 the reality is, he is there as a president because General Tan Shui put him in there. That's the bottom line. Whatever his personality, as least corrupt, blah, 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 it's all. I mean, if you were trying to put yourself in the shoes of General Tan Shui, why would he actually put president, you know, they say in the president's presidential position? Whatever his calculation, I guess probably is working, I guess not. But I think the, the, the problem here is there just one example of whether he is indecisive or not. Because many people, you know, like yourself, there's some who are, who are able to meet him, talk to him, so, well, he's indecisive because if you go and tell him something, he can be also convinced. At the same time, some people also went and say different things, and they think they are, they are able to convince him too. In that case, if you look at only one, with this um, uh, this or them decision, if he is not decisive, why will he make this kind of bold decision in 24 hours. In 24 hours after the energy minister said, an energy minister made a public statement saying to the campaigners, no matter, the, no matter what you guys are doing, we're going to move, move ahead with this project. In 24 hours, you saw the president making this very decisive bold decision, no? But then, if you look at other things, like Altar, particularly there, if you look at that, uh, who is the lead negotiator with the ethnic groups? One is the railway minister, and the other one is the industry minister. And of course, some, you know, one can question why are these two ministers doing the peace negotiation? And what, what is happening in their ministries? Well, nobody knows. You know, railway minister negotiating and industry minister negotiating. But then, these two have a very different personality. This railroad minister is somebody if you approach and then like you come like, okay, I have 11 points and then he said, take 12 points, like I said. Then you have another one who is dealing with the Kachin up in the north. And he is known as the very hardliner. Yeah? So then the question comes is, if the president, first of all, if president has the decision making power solely, why will he not take him out, for example? One, he's not able to make the progress like railway minister is making with the other ethnic groups on this side of the border with the Karen and the Shan. Again, there are many questions that are a bit unknown to us, but what we know for sure, the bottom line is the president is there as a president because Jamaica country put him in there. Um, saying that, yes, it is very dangerous because <laughs> like whether this place make a stop or, you know, we in Burmese politics or probably in some other countries' politics too, is if there is somebody is to be you know, taken out of the position, that person falls sick. Okay? And you never know when President Bain Singh will fall sick for whatever the different reason. So yes, that's the reason that also now we are telling the whole world, all the policy makers around the world is, please support the institutional changes, institutional reform, rather than relying on the personality for the policy. Oh, the president is, you know, reform-minded, or oh, Aung San trust in the president, whatever that is, it's all based on the individual personalities. I think Burma really needs that institutional change rather than based on the individual personalities at this point. So that's for the first question. Um, well, according to my colleagues, uh, who I know from the region and also with my very limited knowledge looking into the different countries. Um, some of my friends said Burma is getting to the Suwajo type. Some of my friends said yes. Some of my friends from Indonesia said Burma is getting into the Suwajo type. And some of my friends from Cambodia said Burma is getting to Cambodia in 1992s in political front and 1998 in economic front. See, I think you will know probably more, more than me on this particular situation, but um, what we are very worried is now with all these agencies from international rushing into, we are very worried of the Cambodian model. Mm -hmm. I, I think uh, definitely Burma doesn't want to follow the Thailand model. I can be sure of that. Uh, I, can, I can be sure of that. That one is definitely. And uh, I personally don't want to follow the Cambodia. Uh, because Hansen has always been there no matter what. After a jingle and all nice, most you know, credited uh, election being held, he stayed there for another 20 years. And then, uh, in Cambodia, we have seen that uh, half a billion dollars being poured every 
<laughs> and uh, that I think, I think, I think people who get rich in Cambodia is only the eight owners who do these pets and, uh, and uh, it, it, it hold, um, land cruiser driven drive to people and uh, the drivers of the land cruisers and uh, some, some NGOs. Cambodians did very good. I don't want it. And just, I just, she's, she's very right to say that Burmese are aggressive or they're very proud of themselves, full of themselves. And I, I think, uh, I think I just want to be, to have our own, you know, special place in somewhere in the So, being more private. I think more, dignity is more important than democracy. I think democracy is, is all, all right, but we need to restore uh, our dignity. And it hasn't been restored. I think uh, this is a big issue for, for, for us. And, and you know, otherwise we will become a country between torn apart, Cambodia and Nepal. Have you been there? Have you been there? Nepal? Yeah. I was there. So I, I'm not worried about this. I, I'm, I mean, top, if, you, if we follow the, the lead of uh, Indonesia, we will be the best. Sure, what, what, is, what is happening now in Indonesia is quite promising. Even though there are a lot of problems, still there. But, but it will be great. But one tiny point, some of the Indonesian friends are now giving advice, advice to the Ministry of Information and Government draft the media law. So this is a very tiny example that we follow, which is which may be a good thing. Just, just to add to, I think like your question of how rich the, the cronies are in the military elites and their businesses. Everything that you see in Burma, like all these you know, visible luxury stuff, but also all the businesses, media side, or the entertainment side, it's all owned by them. And they are, they, are, they are sons, they are daughters, I'm like unbelievably, really. So that's, that's I think, I mean, like looking into a, a case of Cambodia, I think Burma can be even worse than Cambodia if we're not able to manage all these cronies businesses. I think that's another thing. The other, just another point that I want to, uh, I don't know whether we can look into the other model. I mean, like, Indonesia is probably, uh, you know, if we can follow, like, I agree. I mean, with all the, you know, like, ongoing problems there as well, but still, I mean, particularly also when it comes to the ethnic nationality side, I wonder if it is something that, you know, we can actually have more of that path in a kind of time, but I think the, the real problem, that underlying problem that we really need to address uh, is this whole restorative justice. It's going to be way beyond that, like, these two more case and, and Indonesia itself. And I think that's something that we really have to look into in the coming time. I don't know how we will, and under the current leadership from both the Libido and the, the opposition side, I don't know how that issue will be tackled, but it's going to be a huge problem that without, without addressing that restorative justice, it's going to be a, even more, it will come, become a vicious cycle again and again, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Okay, three more. Yes, one, two, three. Please. Dr. Pensway, you spoke about um, the living capacity in Burma and if not, the foreigners will come in and take over. My question is, with increased investment in the Burma's energy sector and a lack of safeguards to ensure that export revenues are properly accounted for, do you think that Burma's uh, problems with cor corruption would be exacerbated and that the resource scarce will be perpetuated? Okay, I'll answer it. Second one? Yes. Um, I'm, I'm wondering whether the, the rice was giving them the carrots relatively too early. Now we can read that then in the things, uh, some of the yeah, things. Can you speak louder? Sorry, I'm, I'm wondering whether the rice was offering the carrot a little bit too early because now they are lifting um, some of the sanctions um, rather than actually waiting a little bit longer to see that actually where this role is leading us. Um, that's my question. Uh, I worked in Burma from 1982 to 1987. I was in UNICEF. And uh, your mention of the negotiation in 1987 about the least developed company status. Uh, we were very much a part of that. 
in that we always said the literacy rate was not 87, 88%. And of course, we always had these big, big negotiations with the government because our data showed that, in fact, it was 27%. And then all of a sudden, it became 27% for the whole country. And then, uh, so I called our counterparts the Ministry of Education, and I said, see how, what is this? We have been fighting about this for six years. And he said, oh, 88% is the clergy. <laughs> and 27% are the primary school students. You see, so it was, and so we got into a very big discussion, not only about that, but about the whole concept, I'm not going to say this correctly, of Yosa. You know, you eat the city. Yosa. 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 So, what does this really mean? And what this means historically in Yama, and I, I'm raising this because we're talking about corruption. What it means, as you know, historically in, in Myanmar is the leader takes for, the king takes for himself first, and whatever is left over goes to the next rank, they take for themselves, and so on and so forth. So you get this feudalistic way of using resources. Now this, how is this connected to education? Well, we, we went into the, we tried to connect this also with education. Now, my wife is telling me to be quiet. <laughs> so, um, so what, what I'm trying to say is, do you see that there are historical reasons for what we see happening today? Not necessarily because of, 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 of all of a sudden the resources are available to those in power, but because it tends to be, maybe it's, it's, it's a historical practice which has not been has modified by any uh, by any new substitute practices such as uh, realization of human rights or realization of the dignity of these people or how these resources should be spread in other ways rather than the most powerful taking for themselves first. Now let me uh, answer the first question. Investors coming in. Investors coming in, the corruption will be will be increasing, no doubt. But the question is, that's why we need to have the transparency, the governance issue. And um, unfortunately, I didn't have time in the previous one also when I was presenting. In the transpa transparency index, Burma right now is third from the bottom. So in other words, the corruption issue is pretty large. And to go back to the model, the Indonesian model. I think I agree with Puma. I mean, the, the, the model of the Burmese will be not the Thai, and probably will be the Indonesian model. And even in the Indonesian model, if some of you uh, know uh, Indonesia much better, the Minister of Finance was an anti corruption czar, this lady. She was so strong, but at the same time, among the politician itself, they were trying to push out. And right now, she is the Vice President of the IMF. The Indonesian cabinet moved him out, moved out, because the rest still wants to have some pie. No? So the corruption will take a long time, but I think the Indonesian model will be the one that we should try to spy. Now, the second question was on excuse me. Sanctions. 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 Oh, sanction, yes. Should be lifted. 
and must be lifted along the way. But it has to be well calculated. Also making sure that that sanction lifting will only like will really help the process reform process to get onto the right track and and you know irreversible and substantial. Rather than that will open up more opportunities to those corrupt elites and military and, and their cronies. So now without like like you you said it very very rightly, there is no safeguard policies and there is this environmental protection law which is a complete flaw and also the investment law is a major problem. Um, and in that, you know, in the current uh, 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 atmosphere, environment at the moment, it's a bit too early, really, to lift all of the sanctions. But what we're saying is, this is something you have for the last 20 years. Use it smart. Use it well. That's what we were telling you to the EU and the US. Just take slow, step by step, and make sure that, just like Clinton said it, you know, and which I was happy when she said it, Actions for actions, but that action for action has to be well calculated. But now the way that EU is, I mean, particularly, um, I'm, I'm quite concerned and, and in fact even upset with the way EU's approach to Burma is to me is more of a, a business oriented now rather than the principle on the, the, the human rights and democracy at the moment. So I think it's a, it's a too early with that, given up all the chaos that you have. So. We will soon see a capitalist invasion in Burma. So they are coming. And no matter what, uh, either Chinese or Chinese are already there. And uh, I think uh, Chinese will have a hard time where it's the market was very competitive uh, in the next few years. Most of uh, the Western uh, gas and oil companies are uh, jumping in. And, uh, but they, they are just waiting because I think uh, sanction. Issue also the other issues, the infrastructure, the infrastructure issues, because you have to in, invest a lot, and uh, if you don't have a, a big amount of gas there, uh, they won't invest in the next 30, 20, 30 years, they won't invest in five years' time or 10 years' time. So I think Burma is now, we, we actually, as I as mentioned, that uh, we now suffer from the resource cars. We are one of the you know, resource rich countries, but now because of whatever well, we produce, Located in a conflict problem, conflict zone areas, Chen or Shan, you name it, all the dam projects, all these are minerals and gold mining, and all places that are kind of trying to contain in these ethnic groups, uh, trying to encourage the big business and uh, promote economic prosperity so that, you know. So I think that, that's a real danger. That uh, lifting sanction will invite uh, a flow of, uh, you know, uh, sorry, the, the, the floods of uh, <laughs> businessmen to come in and, and invest. In them. And we need a, a very clear, I think, uh, protection. Not investment law. The government is now talking about investment law, a friendly investment law, and tax deception, all kinds of things. But I think it's wrong because what they don't do is that uh, how to protect the natural resources. They don't have any clear idea how to protect the environment. But also, also, also a lot of human rights uh, violations taking place. All these, for instance, there are 800 kilometers of a pipeline uh, in, a, in, a, in a American states, and 80,000 people already being homeless. And uh, there are a lot of cases of land grab and uh, land confiscation taking place in all these areas. And uh, I think media inside the country cannot report and write about all these cases. So I think. This is a big issue for us. Go back to the case of capacity, as I mentioned, but capacity and skills. I think the capacity building is a very catchy word these days for the NGOs and the NGO to do capacity building, capacity even the media. I think I think capacity is already there. What we have to do is we carefully create a word capacity development. I think not capacity building. I think because uh, they have a they have a they have a capacity. But you have to develop, you have to be very creative to develop their capacity. Because their capacity is there. And also, I think the most important thing is skill. If you, if you don't have a skill, you've got a lot of uh, NGOs in the UN, or a lot of investors will come and they step up, a lot of talented people, and we will have another internally brain drain uh, population because of a lot of people who have uh, brain drain problems already for the last 30, 40 years. People have left the country. 
But now I think there will be internally brain drain problem we will have we will, will suffer in these coming the days because of these all the rich companies will come and set up a lot of uh, talent because of tons of it's not only the, 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 the investors in business, but also the ingenious, I would say, will also pick up those uh, with the uh, capacity. So that's, that's another, another area that we will have a problem. Um, just uh, like one, one thing that I just want to add to the, the, this uh, ongoing problem, along with what you just said with the land grabbing. This land grabbing, land confiscation is really widespread across the country now. Whether it's armed conflict, non armed conflict, government or non government, it doesn't matter. It's everywhere now. It's a huge problem. And um, there is uh, this uh, farmland bill. I don't know yeah, if you look at it, no? Farmland bill that the, uh, the parliament uh, adopted last year, last year, August, I think, 2011. It's a, quite a problematic uh, 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 law because it gives all the right to the, the president. So, Whatever the authorities are pleased, they can do any part of the land. So that becomes a major problem also for our non Roman ethnic nationalities. This is their cultural inherited, you know, like ancestors, the, 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 the right to, what do you call it, the right to own the land. What are we going to do with this farmland bill now with all these investors coming in? With no safeguard policy and everything. So it's, it's a huge problem with the ongoing human rights violations. The other thing is like I just want to come back to this big elephant in the room that we kind of in the current phase of the this you know civilian um, quasi democracy kind of uh, regime. The I'll just give you one example. I think now you talk about this uh Shui guess with the 80,000 80, people being displaced. Like in the Tawai deep seaport in southern connected to Thailand, which President uh, the, the Prime Minister here like even called for the investment huh? just recently. Um, about 30,000 30, people were already in, uh, impacted from the, that, that project being uh, moved out. But very big problem with the, the military presence. Whether they are in armed conflict or non-conflict, non it doesn't matter. Wherever the Burma army is, nobody can hold them accountable. Nobody, nobody can, can, can stop them what they would do or they wouldn't do. So, we talk about, for example, military rape in the fighting area. But even in that Tawai Deep Seaport project area where the army, the Burma army is there, there are already reported cases of rape. If you even go to the far north in the Kachin state, because of the ceasefire, that's also one of the reasons that people talk about, oh, why the Kachin continue to have this, you know, like, uh, ongoing fighting. And because the Kachin, Kachin had experienced so well with the 17 years of the ceasefire. With that 70, 70 years of the ceasefire, what happened is that they end up having all these Burma army troops in their areas. So in that remote area, even though there are no armed conflicts per se at the present, because the army take over their, the villages and they have uh, their own businesses there, together with their crony people, uh, company like Yusana company, and then what you really see is that local women, as young as 14, 15 year old young women, are taken as Girlfriends, wives, whatever the, the, the label that they will put. But really, it's that slavery that happened at this particular moment, as we say, that nobody knows or talks about it. So again, I think this, there are like the very deep and line problems that Burma still has, that at the moment some of these international players kind of try to you know, set aside to some extent, which is quite worrying for us. But saying that, I just want to come back to your point, whether the current corruption and the practices now is, is a historical. I don't know how my colleagues here feel, but I do agree with you on that. I think there is a transformation, cultural transformation, a transformation in our society is needed. Because I think, I mean, somebody put it very recently that Burma, this is not a reconstruction stage. He said Burma needs nations building. Because Burma, as Burma, was never been a nation. I think I, I tend to agree to that. Because ever since that previous time, feudalism, all this kingdom, you know, independence, all the way, I don't think we, we ever really had a chance to build a nation. It's always always been this imposed unity from the army and the elite government uh, rulers. So I think that's where I would like to uh, respond to you. Yes, I just want to add in, I mean, the, when you add, come, first of the problem is that 
EU all the sanctions that I just want to mention is the is not the pull factor, it's also the push factor from the the, uh, the multilateral bilateral organization. If you look at EU, EU is in trouble. They need to find somewhere where they can exploit. And just a little excuse from Burma they are they are coming in. Same thing with the US, no? I, I'm trying to be fair. US wanted to contain China and near some damn suspicion and suddenly Clinton came running to Burma. No? So it is the attraction not from the Burmese side, it's the push factor from the other side that is pulling them to come, come to the country. And I just want to warn you know, whoever you are helping Myanmar in, in different ways, let us help in an ethical way. Huh? And when I talk about capacity, I was in, in Yangon a year ago, and they had a seminar I presented, and one of the traders was telling me, okay, I can mention the country, it was an American company, they came to Burma, and he said we can sell uh, some machinery. So this simple trader said, okay, so they gave it, them husband and wife a free ticket to go and visit the factory and came back and the down payment two million was given. Since then nothing was heard. So there's a lot of scam going on. They entice you with little penis and get the whole uh, uh, the country or whatever they want. So there's a lot when I say capacity building is not only just capacity building we hear in Nassau and Chiang Mai. We need a real skill skill development, human resource development, so that people understand their, their profession, their technology, so that they can negotiate with the counterpart. And that's the big worry I'm having right now. The country is going to open up all kinds of uh, advisors are coming in and we have millions of advice, different direction, but all have an uh, ulterior motive. They have all motive. And I've been telling students here and everywhere, there's no free lunch. When they say they're coming with a free lunch, they're going to get 100 free runs from you by giving you one free lunch. Okay, any more questions? <laughs> Two more, we still have some time. Providing. What, what, what do we mean by service providing is we have a large number of the refugees 
and also the IGPs, internally displaced people across the border back in inside the country, and also the large number of migrant workers. So service providing is like providing health and education, etc. Services to those people who need from our country, uh, are just displaced in different bordering countries. The other part of the, uh, the component that we are involved is the capacity building, um, not only on the border, but also capacity building for particularly for the activist communities in the country. Those who are uh, you know, who are from the 1988 Our Generation and on board up to 2007, we've been uh, organizing series of trainings on human rights education, human rights documentation, um, democracy, good governance, um, like uh, or, or community organizing and things like that. Different uh, areas, federalism, rule of law. You know, like those guys also from the media side, they also organize trainings for the amateur journalists from inside Burma, giving them the training so that they can go back and they can you know, they can really take the root in the country for the civil society to become vibrant. So that's been ongoing for the past 15 years of the time, I would say. So that, hopefully, even though it's not enough, I mean, compared to the whole world with 50 plus millions, it's not enough. But we hope that seat that we sold for the last 10 plus years might be also a good contributing factor for the current time. Like many environmental activists and you know, like those uh, community development uh, um, activists are there, so that's one thing. So when you ask what is our role now, we do uh, we do look into our role to be uh, where where it's needed. For example, like if we see as a advocacy is still needed, that's what we're doing now. Because many of my colleagues, for example, from the from inside, tell me that there are certain issues that they cannot raise within the country, such as like this human rights violations. Crimes against humanity, you know that. So those are the issues that they cannot speak in Rangoon yet, for example, even though the Rangoon is already open up. In that case, they tell people like me, who are still based outside on the border, to continue to raise the voice for those issues that need to be raised. That's one of the, the role that we play. And the other, uh, 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 the role is like someone like ours, I'm sure, going, going back in is not only just to see the country, of course, right? So I think those of us are really trying to see what is it that we can really be a part of this process to contribute back in the country? But I think the challenge we are uh, facing is, even though also said he got a journalist visa, but the reality for us is that those organizations on the border, particularly the activists and also from the ethnic communities, we are under the category of the unlawful association. Okay? So we, are, we belong to that category, which means if you are associated to the organizations like ours, you can be in prison for three years, at least. Whereas, uh, because we belong to that category, which means we are we are actually criminals in the eyes of the authorities, under their rule of law. Rule of law. So that's why we say, like, where is that rule of law that will guarantee our safety, and also that will guarantee our participation in the process. Of course, when you ask any of those uh, ministers at that point, including the president, have no plan about that. So that's where, where we are in terms of the studies. And I think just to go back to your question is if, if there is any institution that can afford. And at the moment, absolutely none. That's what I would say. I think Parliament is to some extent those MPs in the in the Parliament, progressive ones, are trying to move into that direction. But other than that, like other legal institutions, you know, like judicial systems, all is is none. Yeah, the, the question she's asking, I know, because we have been hearing stories now. During the election, the by-election, there were private group, I think it's unofficial, it's known as the School of Political Science, coming out with their own analysis. How active are they? Just in general, there is a self-censorship among including the media, including those NGOs. There is some censorship is highly involved. So it depends on what they say and they cannot say. But also some part, including like the, the activist group, like the ADA generations, they come up with the uh, violation monitoring report. If you look at it, I think it's only because there is a uh, still limited understanding on how to monitor the elections. So their findings, I would say, are still not adequate. But other than that, there are any legal institutions or anything like a watchdog, that kind of thing.
And to add to that, you know, the, I want to affect the 88 generation. Not, not this one, the one inside. We have to be careful because they have learned their lessons. So they try to uh, operate within the box. No? They dare not go outside the box. As soon as they go outside the box, they might be rearrested. So it's a, it's a very uh, fluid situation. No? They are playing within the rule. Whether I should say it, and I won't be able to go back to Burma. The, now the question now is, there is some same situation like in Thailand. There are some taboo area. Now let me see that. Taboo area in Thailand, you cannot talk about that. In Burma also, we have a taboo area. You don't touch that. As soon as you touch that, you are in trouble. I think there's a question about us here. I think ASEAN is uh, is always always being claimed about the uh, constructive engagement, and I think uh, as I said earlier, Burma is no longer a problem a challenge. So I think ASEAN is very happy, and Burma is the last frontier, and it's, it's both for ASEAN and the Western countries to go in and exploit uh, the last frontier. I think this is, this is what uh, they're going to do, and you know, this is this is this is where. We will see a great game of Burma being sandwiched between the, uh, China and India and, and, and linked to Bill Bangal. Like we are in a strategic position in terms of access to the uh, Indian Oceans. And I think Burma, if Burmese leadership are very wise and they, they have enough wisdom, and if Burmese position are uh, fully aware of all these criteria and all these, our, our strategic. Uh, Position, I think we can play the game very well, but I'm afraid uh, we still don't have enough knowledge and information about how to, you know, play this uh, enough thing. Otherwise, we will just become a uh, you know, small child in the next coming to game. This is what my, my fear uh, is how, how ASEANs and, uh, and uh, the West will come and treat a uh, uh, little boy in Burma. He's white and left over. I think this is what we all fear. We don't have enough strong resistance, and also about sanction issue. I want to talk about it. sanction is, is, is you know it's, it's, it's interesting. Sanction is being suspended. Uh, activists will say that sanction is sanction is is important to remain. But sometimes after I went to Burma, I saw that a deep poverty inside the country. And I, think, I, I I I believe that the sanction also the cipher and sanction is you can visibly see the population. I, I want sanction to be lifted tomorrow, totally, not because of the poverty. One reason, because of mismanagement. I think the generals will be naked. All the tycoons, all the billionaires, a handful of people will be naked because they don't really know how to manage the, all these resources. They be exploited, and they now have a very good excuse to to pinpoint the sanction to say that. I slightly disagree with the activists that to say that sanction. Because of sanction, because the country is poor, it's not because of us. It's because of sanction. They can last 24 years. They have great excuse to say that. But I, I want sanction to be lifted, just to say hypothetically, hey, just, just to be lifted. I don't think they can really manage it. Very well. They don't have, a, they don't have a, any, any, any kind of work or ambition. Yeah. And also, I think I also met a lot of millionaires there who are afraid of sanction being lifted because of the, these. 12 or 14 handful of uh, billionaires inside the country, including Zozo and uh, Kuminai, uh, they uh, told me that um, they are afraid of uh, these uh, multinational, all the, these, these people to come in, all the banks from Germany, and uh, because I asked why, they said it's very competitive. We have, we have, we're very comfortable to just exploit everything, extract everything, and be, be corrupt. We are rich here. But, what if they come in? We are small boys. So this is very, I think, very interesting for us to see uh, how if a session is really lifted and then uh, it's very, very, very competitive for, for the local, local, I think, uh, business. Any last remarks? Well, I would like not to argue with Guan Zhou, but it's just also the, with the sanctions. Is, I mean, our argument really is you already had it 20 years, and then you had this key benchmark set. 
I mean, why the sanctions in, in first place? It's really because of all these human rights violations. I think that is the major key benchmarks that they have to look into. But what we are seeing now is, uh, for example, like EU, the way that they are talking to the Burma people is, you know, it's very tricky in my eyes. I mean, you can be very straightforward. If you want to go ahead and lift the sanctions for the business, your, because your business is all banging your door at the foreign ministries, fine, go ahead. But then, they've been tricky because they're telling, they're asking, they're telling the Burma people in this call and call consultation, they're like, well, now, after the violation, your leader will be in parliament and we will lift the sanctions and you will get the development aid I mean, seriously, if you think about that, then you ask the Burmese, so what do you think? I mean, all the Burmese who are asked with that question will say, we want the sanctions lifted. Without understanding the context of the sanctions, what is involved in there, whether that will still reach many, many of those cronies. For example, now, with all of this you know, business coming, yes, you do. Yes, some of these tycoons are afraid because of their work, <laughs> but many of the others, elites, would like to be more of the, 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 the same tycoons, you see? So, I think that where the problems really lie on the ground because people are actually pushed into, imposed in that particular condition that they are not prepared with the information or understanding and then they are given like, you know, if you are in, put, you put yourself in a Burmese place, if you said, we'll bring you the, the development aid or you know, humanitarian aid or whatever that is, but we can do it if the sanctions are lifted and everybody will say, yes, let's lift the sanctions in 24 hours, get done with it. I guess that's where you know my, my argument will be those who actually impose and now want to live without getting into what is it that they are actually you know doing with that. They, they, they more suffer from uh, fatigue. Oh yeah. <laughs> I think EU in particular, uh, I think they betray their own principles. Uh, uh, will I have the last word? <laughs> I still believe in the Russian Troika, uh, or you can call it three three three-legged uh, system. Whether we like it or not, sanction is suspended now. Whether we like it or not, the foreign investors are coming in. Whether we like it or not, there will be struggles, not the corruption will be there. But in order to check the imbalance, I feel that the government will still be there. The government is one pillar. The second pillar is judicial. We need to make sure that the judicial, the rule of law is there. And to check the judicial and the government, we need a civil society. And there, what I'm mean, harping all along is the capacity building, huh? human resource development, build up the civil society so that that will check the judiciary as well as the government. Thank you. Have a nice day.